Hello and good evening. My name is Ty Terry and I am the current president of the board of directors of Parent Child Plus. Parent Child Plus is a national not-for-profit organization that offers early education programs for school readiness. We support families living in marginalized communities who are experiencing the greatest opportunity gaps. Thank you for joining us as we celebrate Asian Pacific American Month. As part of our celebrations, we are hosting the third in our series on diverse voices in children's literature. And tonight we will be focusing on Asian and Asian American representation. Previously, Parent Child Plus has focused on Black and Latinx representation in children's literature. And these prior videos are available for viewing on our Parent Child Plus YouTube page. We are living in a glorious age of diverse and multifaceted children's literature. I wish that such diversity had existed when I was young. I immigrated to the United States when I was six, neither speaking nor understanding a single word of English. I attended a public school in Manhattanville, which is located in West Harlem in New York City, and all of my classmates were of color. None spoke English voluntarily, and most of them spoke primarily Spanish at home. I know that if there had been diverse literature available at the time, and if such books had been available in my classroom, my classmates and I would have been more self-aware as a result and more confident, related better to each other, and felt more included because as you will recall, this was the era of the Jack and Jill genre of literature. So it is with the greatest pleasure that we host today's event. Before we join our authors and illustrators panel, we also have with us tonight via video, a group of Parent Child Plus and Asian American members of our community each will be recounting the moment that they first recognized or saw themselves in a child's book. Hey everyone, my name is Brian Malong and I'm a learning and evaluation manager for Tipping Point Community, a grant making foundation based in San Francisco. I'm also a first generation Filipino American, but I'll be honest with you, there really weren't a lot of representations of Asian people in children's books when I was growing up. For me, the closest thing I had was the Sweet Pickles children's book series, which actually used animals to depict its characters. Now, animals and people are very different things, but I got a lot of comfort and enjoyment from a diverse set of characters who all had their own personalities and their own stories to tell. I grew up in the 1970s in a suburb in North Carolina, and I was the only Asian child in any of my classes all the way through sixth grade. This lack of representation in my surroundings had a profound effect on me, not just on my identity, but also on my self-confidence and my security as a child growing up, still trying to find his place in the world. So for all of these reasons, I can't stress enough how important it is to increase the visibility of AAPI people, particularly for young children who are at an age when they need it the most. This work is really important, so I'm really glad that Parent Child Plus is highlighting the impact that representation can have on the well-being of Asian children at a time when racism continues to cause harm to the Asian American community across the country. So thank you, Parent Child Plus. Thank you, everyone, and be well. I was in the first grade. I was scanning the library of Highlands Elementary School in Appleton, Wisconsin. There it was, Louisa May Alcott's novel, Little Women. I was immediately drawn to this novel. Like the March girls, I was also one of four scrappy sisters raised by idealistic parents. Like Joe March, I wanted to be a writer. Joe looked nothing like me, and she lived in another century, but she loved books and she loved to write stories. I recognized her as a kindred soul. The first time I saw myself in a book was in college when I took an Asian American literature course. That was when I learned more about my Vietnamese culture. I was able to connect to the story and better understand my grandfather's story of escaping to America. I think I would have been able to embrace my culture much more than now if I were exposed to more books about Vietnamese culture when I was younger. Growing up, all the books that I've seen are more of 
Chinese, Japanese, Korean, but nothing really Vietnamese. It was always Asian American, but not specifically Vietnamese American. So it wasn't until college when I read that book that I was able to really connect to my family's roots. The first time that I saw myself in a book was two months ago, and I was tucking my three-year-old daughter Lily into bed, and I read her her new book, Eyes That Kiss the Corners by Joanna Ho. Growing up, I never really knew where I fit in. You see, I am Hawaiian, I am Filipino, I am Japanese, I am Arabic. In fact, my most vivid memory growing up was a day in kindergarten and I was surrounded by a sea of white children and our activity for that day was to create a family collage project. And so they gave us a stack of magazines and all of these reprints of illustrations from children's books and everybody was busy cutting away, um, cutting out features of themselves that they felt represented them. So while everybody was cutting away, I just kept flipping and flipping and flipping through all of these pages because I could not find myself. I couldn't find someone who had the same almond-shaped eyes as, as me. And I remember feeling right then and there that I was different. And the, for the first time, I've, I felt ashamed and, and less than. And I remember thinking, oh, okay, I need to be more like them than me. And it stuck with me until much, much later in life when I really started embracing and feeling proud of my heritage. So when I was reading Joanna Ho's book, I Set Kiss the Corners to my daughter, Lily, there's a part in the book, there's a part in a book that says, um, when mama tucks me in at night, her eyes tell me I'm a miracle. And when I was reading this to my daughter that night, I just completely filled up in tears. It wasn't just because I saw a character who had the same almond-shaped eyes as me, which that was just so powerful, but it was also the love and the celebration of being different. My daughter turned to me that night and said, Mama, why are you crying? <laughs> and I just looked at her and I said, I just think you're beautiful. And it was the first time that I realized what my role was to help her always feel seen and be seen. So I'll always remember that. Our panelists today include several incredible Asian American children's authors and illustrators who work both digitally and in print. They will discuss in depth the importance of Asian and Asian American characters in children's literature. We hope their discussion will illuminate the impact representation has on the general well being and social emotional development of Asian American children as well as, and very importantly, broadening the perspectives and enriching the lives of all children who do not belong to the Asian or Asian American community. It is my very great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Shuli De La Fuente Lau. Shuli is the creator of the Instagram account, Asian Lit for Kids, and is the content leader at littlefeminist.com, a subscription monthly book club and publishing house. By day, she is an assistant principal at an elementary school. She is also proudly a third culture kid who holds her Chinese Malaysian American identity with gratitude. She lives in Oakland, California with her husband and her two strong spirited and vibrant daughters. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Terry. I'm already so moved by all the sh stories shared today. Today, I am thrilled to be talking about the necessity of representation in children's books for those of Asian identities. We have today three amazing creators with us. The first one is, that I would like to introduce is Joanna Ho, author of the New York Times bestseller, Eyes That Kiss in the Corners. She also has an upcoming book called, um, called Playing at the Border, a story of Yo-Yo Ma and One Day. She's also a fellow educator as, as a high school vice principal. Welcome, Joanna. 
The second creator I would like to introduce is Kat Jiang. She's the author of the Young Adult Trilogy, The Hybrid Chronicles, as well as two middle grade novels, The Emperor's Riddle and The Memory of Forgotten Things. You may also know her for her very ever lovable character of Amy Wu in the picture books, Amy Wu and the Perfect Bow, and Amy Wu and the Patchwork Dragon. Our last creator I'd like to introduce is Julia Kuo. She's the prolific and talented illustrator, most recently of the picture books, I Dream of Popo, and The Sound of Silence. And she has an upcoming story, I Am an American, the Wong Kim arc story, which mm -hmm. will be coming out this November. Welcome all. All of these stories in the video that we just saw are very connected to one's identity and history. When was the first time you saw yourselves in a book? Kat, would you like to start us off? Sure. Oh, oh gosh. No. Um, I think I first time I saw myself was actually um, when I read Harry Potter as a kid, and I read about Cho. And even though there were, you know, there's lots of me that I didn't see her in her, but the main part that I did was just this idea that I think she's the first time I ever saw a. Asian character in a fantasy, like a traditional Western fantasy story of any kind. And growing up, those are the books that I love to read. I love sci-fi. I love fantasy. Um, and I felt like, you know, people like me never ended up in stories like that. And just the idea that she was allowed to just like go to magic school and do all the same things as all the other kids. And not only that, but she was seen as somebody who was like attractive and desirable and like the main character like had a crush on her and thought she was the coolest thing ever. Um, and that was like really important to me as a kid to like, to see that out there. You know, I feel like, I don't think this is the first time I saw myself, but it's the first time I read about an Asian character in a book, which was, I think it's like Tiki Tiki Tembo, or I remember I really hated that book. Um, but I was like, oh, it's Asian people. I'm supposed to like this one because there aren't any other ones. But I think the first time I feel like I related to a character was in high school when we read The Joy Luck Club. And um, I just remember feeling like I didn't I didn't know that there could be people like me in, in a book. And um, like, the, you know, there's some things about that book that I'm like, I don't know why. I just felt like, oh, the mother daughter relationship or this type of relationship. And it's something that I never experienced before, I think, to the point where I didn't Oh, I didn't realize that my connection to that book was so deep because that was the first time, you know, I had seen someone or people that reflected me and my family in some way. Um, so I, I bought this book, How My Parents Learned How to Eat. And so this is about a Japanese woman and an American soldier in Japan who want to go on a date. And so they learn how to eat the other culture's foods ahead of time in order to impress each other. So I still remember the first time I ate a salad and I could not figure out how to stab the little leaves. Um, but it wasn't just about feeling foreign in America. I also had these experiences of going back to Taiwan and not knowing how to eat shrimp and crab as proficiently as everyone around me who were like deshelling them in one swift movement. And so these characters are really different from me and they're from a very different era. But I relate to both of them. Um, I saw in my life at home versus life at school, but also in how I felt foreign in both the US and, and in Asia. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Joanna, you talked a little bit about how um, you didn't really connect with the character until later on in life. I was just wondering, as you were growing up and just essentially having a lack of representation in books you saw, how did this in experience impact your journey? and self-discovery as a writer for children's books. I think it's one of those things that you don't realize has impacted you so deeply until you are further away from it and able to look back. Because in the, I think growing up, I didn't, it's, you know, I, I've been saying this a lot recently, but I didn't realize how invisible I was and I never questioned it. So because I didn't question it, because it was so pervasive to be invisible in everything, I didn't know that I that's something I should question, that that's something I should have pushed on. And I think as a result, there are things that I internalize about myself, you know, eyes just being one thing, like wanting to look different, just being one thing, um, to the point where um, I appreciated a lot that was shared in that video that we watched, where I think, you know, as an educator and then now as a mom, 
that has really made me, I've always been super passionate about inclusion and equity, but the interesting thing is that's always been on behalf of other students, my black students, my Latinx students. And it hasn't been until I like became a mom, until I became a writer that I've been like, oh my gosh, like, hello, Joanna, you are also invisible. You have not been represented. And that's been, I think, a, a really huge part of why I became a writer. I wanted my kids to have stories with kids like them. I mean, it sounds very cliche because I think there's a lot of writers who become writers for that reason. But I think the invisibility and um, the way that that has impacted my personal journey, like I'm, you know, I'm almost 40 and I'm now have been on this journey of discovery of my personal history, my family history of identity development. And I don't want my kids to have to wait until they're like middle-aged before they, they have that sense of self-discovery and identity understanding. Yeah, that invisibility has such an impact on even like feeling like we can take up space in places we are at. Um, Joanne, um, Joanna, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Julia, your illustrations are stunning. If you have not read I Dream of Popo, I'm, let me just show you a page. Um, look at this kitchen scene. When I read this book and I looked at the scene, like every single detail was just like, so on point. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your childhood experiences that ex um, inspired you on your journey to become an illustrator? What was important for you to show when you are illustrating your books? Yeah, so um, so I've spent all my adult life in the Midwest, but I grew up in a really I immigrant heavy part of LA. And so home meant under that others around me understood the immigrant experience and they all understood this double life that we have. Um, but by the time I was in high school, there was actually even a group of Asian American artists exhibiting in LA galleries and being celebrated for their the way that their work mixed cultures. And it was the way it was the first time that I realized that bringing my identity into my work could be an asset. And so, you know, for for children's books, I typically illustrate other people's stories, and that always means research. You know, you have to look into what this environment should look like. It's the only way to be true to the story. But um, I was able to illustrate I Dream of Popo from my direct experience, and that was something I'd never had before. So to be able to draw my grandma's dinner table or what I feel like it should look like when I go back to Taiwan and I hug my grandma, um, that was really invaluable. And, and to put it in a children's book for other Americans to see was very validating. Um, I just love that you know our stories and our memories, are not, they're not just valid, um, but they should be of interest to people who don't look like me. Thank you. Um, Kat, sharing food traditions is such a powerful way to celebrate and share culture with others. Um, similar to how Julia talked about like sharing her childhood experience in a book. And I feel like you do the same in your books. Um, in your picture book, Amy, Bao, Amy Wu and the Perfect Bao, is such an empowering example of that. Um, we'd love to hear a little bit more about the story. Can you tell us about it and the message you wanted to share with children and families? Yeah, thank you. So um, growing up, food was always so important to me. Like it was a huge representation of my culture and also a way that I felt like I stood out. I grew up in like the South in an area that didn't have a lot of Asian Americans. Um, and we were definitely like delineated like by the food that I ate. Like up, growing up at home, we never ate anything except for Chinese food. Um, and I remember also being really proud of the fact that I ate Chinese food and that like, this is what my family ate. And um, I spent a lot of time like cooking with my parents. And for us, that was sort of a way for us to spend time together. Like after I came home from school and they came home from work and they would cook and, you know, I would like help out and we would chat about our days and um, things like making um, bao or like making dumplings was definitely like a whole family or like you know, things we did when like friends would come over, like like Asian American friends. And we would all like make food together and talk and the things to do with your hands. Um, and so I remember like really fondly all of these experiences. And then as I grew older, like, I, you know, I, I got busier and like we, we didn't do this as much. And so I had to make bow for a long time until I was um, – much older and then I started making it again and I realized that oh hey like this is not something you magically get better at when you're older like I still am really terrible at this just like when I was a kid um but it brought back like all those old memories of like happiness but also like frustration at like not getting these bowed correctly 
Um, so that's sort of what inspired Amy Wu. Um, before that, I honestly had never thought about writing picture books. I started off writing young adult and then I wrote some middle grade books. Um, but this is a story that I wanted to tell in a picture book. Um, so for me, it's about culture and about family um, and also just about the frustration of being a kid or anybody and not being perfect or not being good about at doing something. Um, and I have been like so thrilled about the response that Amy's gotten and, and the fact that I've been able to write more Amy Wu books. And it's just so amazing to me, like growing up, um, I don't think, I don't remember ever really seeing like an Asian girl in like a picture book. So the picture books that were popular when I was a kid. And now we have like way more obviously. And um, it just, it's, it's awesome. I hear from like parents all the time saying, you know, my my little child like, you know, is obsessed with like Amy Wu or other picture books. And I'm so, you know, amazed by the fact that, you know, this is something that kids have access to nowadays. The thing I love about each of your books is that there's this element of family that, yes, while Asian, Asian kids can like connect to that, I feel like so many, like all kids connect to this like idea of family and the closeness of family. I've heard um, so many folks say all these like awesome things about Amy Wu's grandmother and just like how how awesome she wa she is. And like, um, and in Joanna's book too, you talk about like that really close bond between like sister and mother and grandmother and Julia Cole, the whole essence of I Dream of Popo is like, look at this beautiful illustration. It's just like this beautiful relationship between a grandchild and her grandmother and their separation and how they still try to be close. I was wondering if each of you could talk a little bit about um, just what inspired you to include this element of family and your s storytelling and your illustrations. Um, yeah, if you, whoever wants to talk first on that. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, it, I'm so curious to hear what the writers say, but for illustration, a lot of these um, layers come from like literally adding different things into the illustrations. And so of course, you know, you wanna show a grandma and her granddaughter hugging, but you can also build an environment that's rich with objects. And so I think that together, these objects point to all that goes on in a family's life outside of the specific story. So each object suggests that there's more in this family's habits and customs that happened before the story and will continue to occur even afterwards. Um, it might be as simple as suggesting that there is a favorite fruit that they eat um, or that they regularly cook with um, sesame oil, soy sauce, and rice wine. And these things don't exist in isolation. They come from a rich, long culture that is actually being passed on through this very family. Um, so I think like the existence of these little habits or rituals and kind of, you know, adding them into the story and creating those extra layers is, is what suggests kind of a deeper connection with the family. Yeah, I know for me, it's been really important from the beginning to show Amy's family in a really positive, supportive way. I think when I was growing up, like there weren't a lot of books about Asians to begin with, but the ones that I did read, you know, that were children's lit, I feel like a lot of them focus a lot on like an Asian American's kids conflict with like their parents because their parents are like, you know, like really stressful or like, you know, are really strict with them. And, you know, like this is, you know, obviously one kind of relationship that is real and, and kids have that and that should, you know, definitely be represented in books and, and talked about, but obviously not all Asian American families are like that. Um, and I, I wanted to showcase like a really supportive family and, you know, obviously even strict parents are supportive too, but I wanted Amy's parents to just be really warm. I want her grandma to be there and just to show the joy and the happiness that is obviously you know true for most asian american families out there this is before i answer the question i'd say funny story is my my mom has like bright orange hair and so when my kids saw my the like the drafts of isaac kiss they were like that's you mommy that's me mommy and then they saw the ama and they were like that doesn't look like our ama <laughs> but when they saw amy Wu's ama with like hot pink hair <laughs> like they were like oh yeah <laughs> We relate to that one. Oh, that's awesome. Um, the, um, the illustrator for Amy Wu, Charlene Chua, she's the one who added the hair. It wasn't in the, um, the original text. And I mean, Charlene's amazing. She's added so many awesome like touches to, to Amy and her family that have really brought them to life. 
So I feel that way about um, Zoom who did Isaac. I just feel like illustrators are, you're all magical human beings. <laughs> they, you take the words and then you build all these layers. It's so incredible. Definitely. Um, to answer the question though, I feel like, I think very similar. I really echo what Kat and Julia shared. And also for me, you know, when I was thinking about how does a young girl recognize the beauty of her eyes, I was like, maybe she goes through a day and people just tell her how, how beautiful her eyes are. And that's kind of like, wah, wah, like, yeah, right. That doesn't really, no, no matter how many times somebody tells you, you never believe it, right? And I wish, sadly, that that was not true, but it doesn't matter. It's something that has to come sort of from inside. And I really, like, I really kind of went deep into like, okay, well, what does it really represent? And how could she have this internal change? And my first thought really was um, her family. And I think, and I didn't realize this in the moment when I was writing, but I think I realized in school visits when I get asked about the family and why there's no men in the book. Um, I grew up with a single mom and my grandma, my ama lived with us for a little bit. She came from Taiwan because my akong, my grandpa, he passed away when my mom was really young. And so my whole life has really been like my mom, my ama, I have a little brother, but I think it came a little bit subconsciously. I've learned that more as I write more, like things come out in my stories that are subconscious, like parts of who I am that I don't realize are coming out. But I think that, um, so that, that was the subconscious part. And then the other part is, I, when I really thought about what eyes represent beyond just like the physical shape, it's sort of like, where did I get my eyes? Where do we get our faces? And our, you know, so many things are passed down, just like what Julia was saying, like it's what's passed down, like our culture, our heritage, our food, our traditions, our physical features I, I say so much about who we are and who we're from and where we're from. And so I think it became important to me that that this wasn't a book just about like, hey, it's okay to look different or it's okay to look how you look, but that it had, you know, a deeper meaning because I think to be able to recognize and to really come into that self-acceptance, it's a, it's a much longer journey than just recognizing it's okay to look the way you look. It has to do with feeling proud of where you're from. And I, I love that because in essence, like, yes, the girl gets her eyes from her family right but she also gets this sense of like I am a revolution because of who I just because of who I am and my absolute favorite page in your book Joanna is this one where she she's like standing there and she's like I'm yeah I am a revolution and I'm strong and I'm brave and I am beautiful could you um talk a little bit more about this I this act of self-love that like is this through line throughout your book um it's a message that all children need to hear, especially Asian children, um, in regards to eyes that are so oftentimes a source of ridicule. Um, yeah, you have the sense of like, yes, I'm stepping into my own power. As an advocate for social justice, why do you think this message is even more important to share right now for both children and caregivers? Yeah, I think that... I mean, it has a lot to do with invisibility and that's a systemic issue, but it's also a cultural one in some ways. You know, there's like a sense of you put your head down, you just do, I feel like that's very much what I grew up thinking. Like you work really hard and people will recognize your hard work and you kind of, you stay out of the thing and it's okay, you know, you like stay, I don't know. And so I think that, and then there's also this like humility, this layer of like, we don't learn to speak high praise ourselves you know you don't you like it's more about like we put ourselves down in some ways and um i think that so i think and that's not i think there's like a beauty in that in the culture but i think the way it plays out in this system is that we perpetuate our own invisibility without intending to and so i think it's important that we recognize one that it's okay, I think someone said it earlier that it's okay to take up space and that we have to take up space, that we have to speak out about whether it's like bow or whether it's like our popo or if it, whether it's like what some specific social justice issue that we have stories that matter and we have things to say that matter and our experiences that have been invalidated for so long, they really matter. And like, we have to step into the discomfort of sharing that with other people, if that makes sense. And I don't, because I think what I realize is nobody's gonna do that for us. Nobody understands 
our experience the way we do or the systemic ways we have been impacted. And so no one will learn unless we talk. Yeah, I totally get that. As as a child, I remember like wanting to take up as little space as possible, right? Um, there were some times where teachers would be like, stand up or raise your hand if you're born in another country. And I like never did. Cause like, why would I like, yeah. Why would I tell everyone that I was different from them? Right. Because being different wasn't like accepted. You, you were trying not to be different. You're trying to be a, as similar as possible to everyone else. Mm -hmm. And there's so many children who, um, who share this immigration story. Um, and who are even currently, like there's still a lot of children who are still immigrating to the United States and know that profound feeling of um, strat straddling two cultures. There's like this great deep mm -hmm. loss and grief, but also like rediscovery. Um, Julia, in I Dream of Popo, um, when I read it, it like really hit the mm -hmm. heart, my heart. And I know it's like hit the hearts of many folks who have read it. Um, what roles do you think picture books like I Dream of Popo can have in helping young children navigate and process complex topics like this? Yeah, I just want to say Livia, Livia's writing is amazing. Um, so I guess to answer your question, I think it's ultimately about maybe exposure and reflection. Immigrants in America encompass such a diverse array of experiences. So the more stories we have that portray a variety of immigrant experiences, the better. So if a story is similar enough for a child to see themselves in the book, that story is valuable in normalizing this experience and saying, well, this character was sad to leave her purple. I guess I felt pretty sad when I left my purple too. Um, but beyond just providing a mirror, I think it's invaluable for picture books to introduce stories that diverge slightly from one's experience. So not just Chinese stories, but Taiwanese ones, and not just Taiwanese stories, but Malaysian and Vietnamese ones. Um, so, you know, for a child to see how much the character in I Dream of Popo loves grandma's dumplings and to reflect back on their own life and think, well, my family doesn't make dumplings, but I love it when we make kimbap together. And kimbap is what makes me feel nostalgic for my grandma. Um, I think that these moments are what are really special and valuable in processing one's really complex, but I would like to say rich experiences. Yeah, I think it's it's great um, that, like what you said, that you know these books are not only just important for kids who have that exact same experience, but kids who can see themselves in other ways. Like um, a lot of teachers, and when I do like school visits for like kids who've read like Perfect Bow, um, I, all the time I have teachers saying like, "Oh, like my kids love this book." Like not only the kids who've actually, you know, made bow at, with their families and understand what that is. But, you know, other kids be like, oh, like we don't make bow, but like we make like empanadas or we make samosas or like we make Christmas cookies every year. And I, I totally understand where Amy's coming from and I understand that. And so it, I think it, it allows kids obviously to reflect on their experiences, but also reflect on the ways that they are similar to other people, even if they're like outwardly different. Like it doesn't matter that they make bow and I make empanadas or whatever. Like we are all similar because we have the same feelings and these same experiences um you know they're different in like great ways too but we're all similar like on the inside in many ways as well and i think it's really important for kids to to know that as we've been hearing these deep stories of identity that are reflected in these books it might be making you think or question like what are the books that are in my home or the ones that are, i'm checking out from the library and you might be asking yourself, like, how do we address diversity and counter racism through stories, not just for um, those of Asian identities, but for everyone? Um, so I would love it if whoever is listening, if you could drop some tips or things that you have been doing with your children or um, children in your lives. Um, because there are so many ways we could go about this, right? But before we talk to children, here are some questions that I often ask myself when I'm thinking about how do I talk to children? Whose stories have my child heard and know, right? And whose stories have we not heard yet? What stories I'm missing? Like, what is the inventory of the books in your home? And even as we talk here, I also just want to say, like, we have a lot of Chinese representation in this group, but Asian books are way more than just like Chinese stories. Um, and so 
as you're thinking, do I have Asian stories in my home? Are you including South Asian? Are you including like mixed Asian, right? Stories as well. Another thing I like to ask myself is like, what can I unpack and dis dismantle in myself as an adult? Because the act of um, being anti-racist and anti-bias is like a journey. And oftentimes I feel like the conversations I end up having with my daughters oftentimes flow out naturally with like what I'm wrestling or thinking about as an adult myself. Um, and another question I often ask myself is like, who is telling the story? Who's being centered? Um, oftentimes in stories we have this like white cisgendered norm. So how are we shifting that to be more expansive or more inclusive and reflective of our diverse world? And there's this term own voices that is essentially just used to identify books with an underrepresented stories that they are written or illustrated by members of that same group. It's essentially the idea of like, we are the ones telling our own stories and all of the books that have been mentioned so far today are own voices. Um, yeah, so I, as we, as you are here, I know a lot of you are wondering how can I, what can I shift, right, in my daily life? What can I shift in my work? Um, I think it often has to do with questions, right? asking your students or your kids questions. What do you notice? Um, do you see this character? How do you think they feel? Um, it might also mean like being super explicit with the takeaways you want children to have, right? Like if someone makes fun of how you look, what can you say? Um, or our skin can be many different shades of brown. Black is beautiful, brown is beautiful. Why do you think so? Um, so I talked briefly about um, own voices and the books that all of you have um, and the necessity for all of us to tell our own stories. Julia, um, Joanna, and Kat, how do you see your work in reaching parents and children with your stories as, you, as a way to build the next generation of Asian authors and illustrators? I think, so. I think first, just like the collection of the, just the picture books, at least in this group of people is a great example of what's like, what's possible. You know, there is such a wide range of experience and like portrayed experience. And I think that that's so valuable to share. Um, and personally, I, I am like personally obsessed with the books by Julia and Kat and read them frequently in my home. Um, and so just huge fans. But I think in terms of the way our work, I think one, it's about showing what's possible, right? Of challenging this notion and disrupting the narrative of invisibility, disrupting that like tiger mom narrative of the more stories. I think we, you know, I've talked, I think we've maybe all heard the danger of the single story. So I think for the Asian American Pacific Islander population, it's more like the danger of no story. And then when we finally have a story, a lot of times it's a very, um, I think there's a single one. It's like the tiger mom one, or it's like the it's an immigrant one, potentially. But um, I think it's a way to show that all the different parts of our stories and all the different stories that we have to tell are valuable and important. And I really loved what was shared earlier is that they should be read by all, and that picture books especially I feel like are really powerful because they speak to both the the young people and to the adults who read them to the young people. So I hear frequently from teachers or from adults who are like, oh, like this, you know, like this book spoke to me, but also that this made me question some things about the world or myself. And it was a springboard through which I could have conversations with my classes or with my kids. And I think that is one reason I love picture books is because there's so much power an opening conversation about really important topics. Yeah, totally. I just want to build upon what Joanna just said. Like I, you know, in in sharing more more variety of stories, I would love if these books could encourage families to reflect on and value their own specific story. You know, have a family conversation about like, oh, if if our story, if our family was in a book, what would that book be about? And I would love for parents to see these books and say like, wow, this had a big impact on my child. I would love it if one day my child tells our family's story through, um, through writing or drawing or maybe some totally different industry. 
you know, through medical research. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think there's just a lot of room for exploration. Definitely. I mean, I, I think both of what you guys said is is definitely so true. Not only that, like like we talked about earlier, the importance of having different kinds of stories. Um, because like I like my answer to the first question, like I love fantasy. I didn't feel like there were any Asians at all in fantasy. And I remember as a kid, like a small child, I actually actively avoided books with like the few books that I did find with Asian main characters. I felt like they were all about like sad things like, you know, like trouble with my parents or like I immigrated to the US and everybody's mean to me. And I just like, I didn't want to read about those things as a child. I wanted like dragons and like wizards and stuff. Um, and again, not saying that those books aren't important or aren't valid. And, and you know, obviously there are kids out there who are having those experiences and need to see themselves in those books. But it's the unfortunate thing of only having those books is that every other kid who wants to read about themselves, but in other situations, like don't have that. And I think it's wonderful and validating for not only those kids themselves but like Joanna said it's, it's important for other people like non-Asian people to see that too um because like what you know it may be subconscious but if other people don't see Asians in in every sort of experience out there in fantasy and whatever then you know even if they're a small child they might not be thinking it consciously but subconsciously they start thinking like oh, oh they don't belong in those places like that's not a place where like asians like belong and and then it, that you know that's not what we want our kids and and everybody to be believing nowadays so i think it's it's so important that there's more you know diversity in literature thank you that's the beauty beauty of multiple stories because we each even though we're all like maybe the same culture, like we each hold such different experiences. And so I'm really looking forward to having and reading and just enjoying more stories in the future. I know I know it's just gonna get more and more inclusive, hopefully. And so thank you so much for each of your work so far. Um, it's been a pleasure hearing from you and um, your perspectives and your background stories. We have some time um, left for some questions um, from the audience. So if you have any questions, if you, you could go ahead and drop it in the chat. I think we have one to start us off. Books are such an important way to broaden the perspectives of young children when you are writing or illustrating. How do you think about those bridge building aspects of your work? Bridge building, I love that. Um, I mean, I can say it's definitely something I think about a lot, especially in picture books, because um, I feel like in picture books, you have so little space um, that it's easy. It can be easy to, you know, accidentally say the wrong thing and you don't have room to like explain yourself right like it's not like a novel where you have like eighty thousand words and like you can like say one thing but then like qualify it with like this or that or and um the third amy Wu book is amy Wu and the warm welcome it's about amy um meeting a a like a, a new kid in her class who just immigrated from china and he doesn't really speak english very well and her experience is trying to like welcome to her class um and i i remember working a long time on the like the plot and the words because I was just like worried like oh like what things am I could I be inadvertently saying by like having this line here or like describing him in this way or having this scene occur because you know you, you try to say one thing but you you know with a young like if you're super young readers you don't want them to actually think you're implying that like this thing is bad that you didn't mean to say was bad or that this thing is like you know a, a, an embarrassing thing to like do or things like that um and I think that, you know, you have so much responsibility to your young readers to to not, you know, pass on bad prejudices to them, to accidentally say things that like you didn't want to say at all because um, their minds are so, so open um, and you want them to, to, to learn and experience good things, not bad things. So I definitely think about it a lot, especially for, for books for young kids. Julie, did you want to go? <laughs> I'm kind of stumped. <laughs> I don't think I think about this explicitly for illustration. I think um, I think for me, what's ironic because the book that my book that's coming out in September about Yo-Yo Ma is literally about him sending a message about building bridges. So I suppose in that book that was like a little more intentional. But I think for me, when I approach writing, I very much approach it as a tool. Like I said, 
to bring some kind of critical, to help students and young people be more critical uh, of the world in a way that I hope helps them work towards justice. So I feel like for me, there's a very social justice aspect of the world work. And is that bridge building is in like, I want everyone to be in harmony and be friends, like maybe long-term in the future, ultimately, if we can really dig through the like critical and systemic and um, things that are oppressive about our, our world. And so I feel like for me, I try to write stories that help people, I won't say help, that can be used as a way to um, just analyze and examine though, whatever it is, whether it's racism, whether it's uh, toxic masculinity, or whether it's like the way we dehumanize immigrants or refugees. Um, so I think that there is, you know, a few steps on the line and aspect of bridge building, but first I think there needs to be an aspect of like critical understanding and examination so that people feel empowered to do the bridge building because I don't think that genuine bridge building can happen without addressing all the things that are happening that prevent people from coming together equitably. Yeah, so I think the dehumanization is a big thing. I was thinking about the, the next book that is coming out. It's called I'm an American, the Wong Kim Ark story. Mm. And I don't think I really thought about it in, in the terms that we're describing now, but this is a story from a long time ago, 1895, and people dressed very differently, both Chinese and uh, Westerners. And I think that throughout the whole story, I was very conscious of not letting the scenes look foreign and strange because it was about Chinatown in San Francisco. And to one group of people in the story, it was foreign and strange, but to other the other group, it was home. And so I really wanted to show that even though these people were wearing outfits that don't get worn anymore, they were doing things like sweeping and sitting around and talking to each other and living a normal everyday life. And that the all of the the facades of you know the the time and the period and um, they're just they're more superficial than anything else. Um, and so when I was even thinking about how to show certain emotions, like um, people were cruel to Wong Kim Ark, I didn't want to show um, some like old school style of shaming or you know um, you know like or if it was even longer ago, I didn't want to show like. Um, you know, people like with their arms locked up and things. But instead I showed a scene where a group of people was ignoring someone who looked despondent on the corner because that's something that happens every day and right now. We walk past people who are in need and we ignore them and that's a form of cruelty. And so I really wanted to find ways to show that even though the story is very, very different than what real life is now, um, the, the core of it is the same. It's about it's about how to accept people that look different than you. I think really quick, I would just jump in. What you said, Julia, really triggers for me a thought where I feel like as creators who have historically been marginalized, it's I, we have to be, actually like for me, there is like this innate sense of wanting to explain. Like if I write a Chinese word or a Mandarin word, I am conscious that there's like a white audience that is the dominant audience and having to rein that in for myself and be like, no, I'm centering my character and my story. And like, it's almost like I have to remind myself to do that, that I need to center. Like, I don't want to explain the language. I don't want to explain. If you don't know what Tiger Mom is, you look it up, you know, you Google. But like, there's this sense of wanting to make sure that we're, for me anyways, but it sounds like from what you're saying, Julia, this idea of like wanting to make sure we don't other ourselves um, in our own stories, um, but because we've grown up being othered our whole lives, for me, I have to battle that, that like internal thing that's like trying to other my own story in my own writing. And so yeah. I guess to the question, the bridge building question, there's an aspect of just like, I'm trying to just center my own story first, <laughs> forget like the other bridge building aspect of that, like let me have a space to just tell my story. And if you want to build a bridge to me and to that character, to that story, like that's beautiful, but there's a power in just letting us tell our stories without that other part. I don't know if that makes sense. 
Yeah. In so many ways, I feel like your books are, are the bridge builders. They're the books that are ch changing and shifting the narratives that we also used to the perpetual foreigner or like um, the one of the, you know, the yucky lunch, whatever that narrative is. It's like, because we're the ones telling our story and you're the ones telling our stories. These are in essence, like the things that shifting and widening what people understand Asian or Asian American experiences to be. We all know that, but like, does the rest of the world know that? So, um, and taking a book, a children's book is such a easy introduction to that, right? You could read a book with an Asian character if none of your kids are Asian and that like broadens that perspective already naturally. Um, I could talk and talk forever with all of you, um, but we are wrapping up with our time. Thank you so much for your time, for your thoughts and mostly for your creations. Um, they have touched my life and I know they have touched um, thousands of children's children around the world. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Terry. Hi, Terry. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks everybody who are watching. Hello again. Um, Parent Child Plus wishes to give a huge thank you to all of our amazing video speakers and panelists for so generously giving of your time and for sharing your thoughts and perspectives with us today. We hope, we hope, Parent Child Plus hopes that our presentation has been both um, informative and thought provoking. I thought it was very thought provoking. Um, and we encourage you, dear reader, to support more authors, illustrators, and books which feature Asian American and Pacific Islander characters. Parent Child Plus stands with, and we are committed to working together with our partner agencies, community staff, and families to give children residing in underserved communities nationwide a level playing field and an equal start in their educations. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Good night. <laughs>